Hebrews chapter number 7. I'm going to read a few verses, then we'll have a word of prayer. Okay, go to the Father in prayer. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 7, and look at verse number 22, where we left off. Um, we, we studied last, last time. <clears throat> Hebrews 7 and verse 22. Here we go. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can get into your word uh, each week, both here on Wednesday nights and then Sunday mornings. And just fellowship one with another in your word. Uh, true worship is, is those who worship the, the Father in spirit and in truth. And uh, we, we, this is a, a spiritual worship, Father, to come together in, in prayer, in, uh, in grace giving, in, in song uh, as we have our uh, service on Sundays. But also, most importantly, your word. To look into your word, to study your word, to see more about your son, our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we study out Jesus Christ as you presented him to the nation of Israel in the book of Hebrews, may we give you more glory tonight as we learn more about your son, the Lord Jesus. We give you thanks and praise in his wonderful name. Amen. 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 All right, as we left off last time, and, and we have we have a couple of new brothers today, and maybe some people are listening new, we ended uh, chapter 7 by showing that when God Almighty made the covenant with the nation of Israel, um, because we do have uh, those who are new, and sometimes you can't really see the chart as well, uh, on the video. This chart right here is, is a chart of the scriptures. Some people are, are, are very uh, uh, visual. Uh, they need visual tool like this. Some people are more audio. I've learned from preaching that there are people who like the written word. That's how I am. But there are others who like uh, to see visual. So we now videotape these, put them on YouTube. But we also record the audio. Some people like to download the audio and listen in their iPods while they work out and, and so forth and so on. Well, for those who like a visual form, oh hi, for those who like the visual form, this chart is, is to rightly divide the word, it's the scriptures. Hi, Maria. Come on in. Sorry about that. Uh, we, we got a couple of new brothers. Brother Johnson, I want you to make sure I'm recording properly. We just, we just got started. I'll, I'll introduce you to the brothers on the break. So this, this chart right here is simply the 66 books of your Bible laid out in visual form. Uh, for those who uh, can see right here, we start with Adam, the first man. That's Genesis. And at the end, you see the great white throne judgment. There's the Lord Jesus Christ standing. You see the lake of fire here. That's the end. And all through here, you see God's dealing with humanity. God in the beginning created Adam. We know Adam has fallen. Adam and Eve fall. And over the course of time, God has all these nations, what the Bible calls Gentiles, and what happened was, in order to reconcile the earth back unto himself, God, who created Adam to do that, and he's now falling, God had to produce another man in the earth, the seed of the woman. And, what, and who that is, he first called out Abram, Abraham in Genesis 12. How are we on the videos? Did I do it right? Okay, good. So he, he calls out Abraham. And what you see, this blue line called promise, this is God separating the Hebrew people. The first time the word Hebrew is used in scripture is with, in Genesis 9, uh, 14, Abram the Hebrew. And so God, you see this blue line going up. Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob, his name is changed to Israel, princes of God, uh, the, the, the princes of Almighty God. And now we see this blue line up top here. This is the Bible uh, following the nation of Israel. But remember, there were still less Gentiles down here. And when you look at the books of your Bible, Genesis through Malachi, the information found here is Moses and the prophets. God brings out Israel from Egypt through Moses. He gives them the law, the Ten Commandments, and the rest of the statutes and judgments, 613 to 633, uh, uh, all those commandments. Civil laws, ceremonial religious laws, and obviously the moral law, the Ten Commandments. He separates that nation. He, 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 he brings them out as a people out of Egypt. But then they desire a king. Not the first king, Saul. That was an error. It was 
the second king, David, type of the Lord Jesus Christ, literally the father of the Lord. He's called the son of David, the Messiah. And God promised them a kingdom in the earth. And that continues on. He has a throne here we see in Luke 1 that Jesus Christ will come and sit on David's throne. The way God dealt with the people of Israel is through the law. What, what he's prophesying back here, like in the book of Daniel, is God is pro pro promising or prophesying through the prophets that God will give Israel a kingdom of heaven on this earth. The ministry back here of Genesis to Malachi is Israel. And they're under the law, okay? So that's what, that's what the focus is in Genesis to Malachi. Now, when you come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, you see John the Baptist show up. He's the forerunner of the Lord Jesus. He calls out a believing remnant out of this nation. By the way, they're still God's people. They're nigh unto God. Of these people, 12 of them, Peter, James, John, and the rest, uh, are ordained to be apostles. The Lord Jesus Christ comes. They're still under the law. Most of Christianity doesn't understand that when you go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like most of Christianity does, those books, the doctrine in those books do not fit here in the dispensation of grace. It is still the law. Paul says about the Lord's earthly ministry, he was made of a woman made under the law. He was a minister of the Jew. Go not into the way of the Gentile. Here, we're down here. Any city of the Samaritan enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of house of Israel. So Israel is still under the law. What's going on here? The kingdom is at hand. It's within reach for the nation. The earthly ministry of Christ is to Israel only first. It is the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel that was preached by John, by the Lord, by the twelve, by Peter and Acts, and all the way up to Stephen is the gospel of the kingdom. Where that information is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, we're studying the book of Acts as well on Wednesday. Next week, we'll be back in Acts. When you come to the actions, the activities of the 12 apostles, really, it's the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost through the 12. But then something happened later, but we'll get to that. You see Peter at Pentecost. He's speaking to those Jews at Pentecost. Once the church, the, the kingdom church starts to grow, thousands are added. It became a burden on the 12. So they called out seven men, made them deacons. One of them was named Stephen. So here's Peter and the little flock. The kingdom is offered to Israel a renewed opportunity to receive their Messiah and their kingdom. It's still to Israel first, but then the Gentiles will get a chance later. It's the gospel of the circumcision, Paul calls it, Galatians chapter 2. Well, what happens? In Acts 7, they stone Stephen, right? A man filled with the Holy Ghost. Who shows up? Saul. And at the fall of the nation of Israel, at that time, God concluded the entire world in unbelief. So in Acts 7... When Stephen is stoned, Paul that comes on the scene, God in Acts 9 saves the chief of sinners, Saul of Tarsus, makes him the apostle Paul. Look how the blue line goes down. Israel falls, but they also diminish. Romans 11, 11 says they fall, they diminish. Watch this. And so what happens is Israel goes from being the special people of God. In the book of Acts, they start to diminish, diminish, diminish. What we see also is Paul's ministry beginning to grow, grow, grow. I tell people after Acts 15, you don't see Peter anymore. Did you ever notice that? The last words of Peter is found in Acts 15, where he says, God has, has, will, will save us Jews one day as he has saved those Gentiles. You don't see Peter anymore after Acts 15. Why is that? Peter, the head apostle to Israel, his ministry has now been postponed in this dispensation of grace. Who becomes the main apostle in Israel? James, the Lord's brother. His name means Jacob. James in the New Testament is Jacob of the Old Testament. means supplanter. James, his ministry supplanted it, uh, Peter's temporarily. Peter's ministry will pick up again out here after the rapture. In the tribulation period, Peter's ministry will be the issue. But what we have to do is we now see that Paul's ministry, his, his ministry is now in, 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 in effect. Where you and I live is in the dispensation of grace. That's why you and I need to study Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, to understand what the body of Christ is all about. That's why Romans through Philemon, so let's look at it. Genesis through Malachi, to Israel, their history. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, their Messiah shows up. The book of Acts, their fall and diminishing. Paul's epistles come next. Romans through Philemon, the dispensation of grace. Um, it's about the body of Christ. It's to us and about us. All of the Bible is for us, 
but not every book of the Bible is to us and about us. The dispensation of grace is, is God offering grace and peace to the world. The kingdom of heaven on this earth, the earthly kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom is postponed. Romans eleven twenty five. 25, Paul says. Paul calls his message the mystery of Christ. It's the church, the body of Christ. It's the gospel, not of the circumcision, but of the uncircumcision, the gospel of the grace of God. It's the mystery, the preaching of Jesus Christ. We'll look at that in a moment, according to the revelation of the mystery. Go with me, if you will, to Romans. Hold your hand in Hebrews. Go to Romans 16, verse 25. Uh, like Brother Les, he says that a lot of uh, people who call his ministry or watch his ministry have never seen this verse in Romans. And he's right. Even if they've read it, because the churches aren't teaching That's right, John. Because of the churches aren't teaching it, the, the people don't understand what this verse means. But look at Romans 16, verse 25. Paul, he ends the book of Romans by saying, Now to him, speaking of God the Father, now to him that is a power to establish you according to what? My gospel. What's Paul's gospel? Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Paul says the gospel of the grace of God. Not just that, but watch this. And the preaching of who? Jesus Christ. But according to or in line with the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now it's made manifest. You and I as believers today have to have a sound uh, teaching to us, and it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery. If, if you aren't receiving the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery, your Christian life is not being edified, it's not being established, you're not being grounded in truth. It's, it's fine to know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the churches are teaching. But that's not the information that will establish you in what God is doing today, the present day truth. If you're going to know what God is doing, you have to go to Paul. He's our apostle. Romans through Philemon, the preaching, notice what he says, my gospel. If God's going to establish you by Paul's gospel, that means you have to be in Paul's epistles. But also the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. It's that information about our Lord Jesus Christ, but how Paul preaches now. How is this dispensation going to end? One day, and it looks like we're close to that day, the last days of grace, the, the, the Lord will resurrect. It's called the rapture, the catching away, 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, it, it, we, it's commonly known as the rapture, the caught up, caught up, but it's called the resurrection. The body of Christ will meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. He'll come down, we'll meet him. What's going to take place then is the judgment seat of Christ, what people call the Bema seat. That's the Greek word. The judgment seat of Christ is where you and I as believers have our life judged by our Lord. And what he's going to look at is, your, is your, your conduct, your service, and your suffering for the grace of God. He wants to see if after you're saved, did you get the Pauline grace message both in you and let it work out through you. The life of Christ in you and out through you. That's all he's going to check. And based upon your, your, your faithfulness to this message today, you will either receive, you will receive a reward or lack thereof. You will either get rewarded or you'll suffer loss. Unfortunately, most of the body of Christ rejects this information. As you can see, you don't get a lot of people who understand or even believe this message. Well, once we're there, we're going to go and Christ will, as, as Paul says, hand us over to God the Father. He will give us our positions of authority or lack thereof in the heavenly places. But God is not done. Look at the rest of this chart. The books of Hebrews to Revelation play a part in God's plan and purpose with Israel. Why, why call it Hebrews? Notice Paul's book is called Romans, the first book. Those are the Gentiles. God names this book Hebrews because he's calling the people of Abraham, the physical seed of Abraham, back. And what he's doing is he's going to call them back. And Hebrews to Revelation, they actually speak to Israel about their future, future from us, and how God is going to pour out his wrath there's going to be seven years of tribulation called the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah. The second coming, the physical, literal. Here, Jesus Christ shows up, body of Christ, in the air. Here he comes, and his feet actually touch the Mount of Olives, where he went up in Acts chapter 1. Christ will come back. He will literally rule on this earth. There's his kingdom. There will be a thousand-year first installment of that kingdom. And what's taking place is God... God's word is going across to the Gentile nations. Israel is teaching the Gentiles the law. 
After the first thousand years whereby Satan is in the bottomless pit, we're, we're going to study the book of Revelation one day, where you're going to see that Satan, at the beginning of the thousand years, is put into the bottomless pit. He can't fool the nations for that thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, though, Satan is loose for a season, Revelation, John says to Israel. He's going to gather a uh, remnant of Gentiles who are rebellious against God. And instead of taking 6,000 years to destroy his enemies, God Almighty is at the end of that thousand year when Satan and his, and his minions from the earth stand up against the Prince of Peace. God the Father from the heavens is just going to zip them all. Then the great white throne judgment where well, all the lost of the ages from Cain all the way through will now, now stand before their judge and get thrown into the lake of fire. That's the Bible. But Hebrews through Revelation show that future prophetic time of Israel. Now, what is the focus here? Go back to Hebrews chapter 7. What is the focus to the Jew in that day after the rapture? What is the focus on that, on, in that day? Well, Jesus Christ is their high priest. Um, he, he now, I'm going to close the chart. Here's the beautiful thing about this chart. If we close the chart and we don't see the dispensation of grace where we live, if, if Paul's epistles never happened, we can see that at the time of the early Acts period with Peter and, and, and the rest of the little flock, it was almost time for God to pour out his wrath. Now, we know instead of pouring out his wrath, he, he, threw, he poured out unprophesied grace. But if he poured out his wrath, look, all this was, was about to happen in their lifetime. You know, the Lord says there'll be some standing here who should not taste of death till they see the Son of Man come in his kingdom. Well, had the dispensation of grace not come, there would have been people still alive who would have seen him come in the second coming. So let's look at it that way. What is Jesus Christ doing? When he died, he, buried, he was buried, he rose again the third day. But in Acts 1, he ascended to the heavens right in the cloud with the angels. And as Daniel says in the prophecy, he, was, he, he came up to the Father, the Ancient of Days, to receive a kingdom. He says in that parable, the Son of Man shall leave, uh, he'll go into a far country, receive for himself a kingdom, and to return. Well, what is Jesus Christ doing up there at the right hand of the Father in prophecy? Well, he's sitting in the temple as the high priest. Let's look at that. Verse 22. By so much, uh, uh, Hebrews 7, 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. The fact that Jesus died for the sins of Israel under the Old Testament, he was buried, he rose again, his resurrection assures that believing remnant that he will give them their new covenant kingdom. Now watch this. Verse 23, and they truly were many priests, speaking of the Levitical priesthood, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of what? Yeah. Remember, the high priest was to stay in power until he died. So once he died, then the next one, constantly down. But what if you have a high priest who never dies? The Lord Jesus. Well, he's a priest forever, like Melchizedek, right? We went through that. Through that. By the way, brothers, these, these studies, uh, brother, brother Ryan, who's not here today, when he gets back, he can make those past studies available, too. We, we've gone all the way up to this point. Look at, ver, look at verse number 24. But this man, the Lord Jesus, because he continueth ever, hath a, now watch this, an unchangeable priesthood. He has never changed. Look at the rest of that, 25. Wherefore he, that's Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God, how? By him. You remember the Lord says to Israel, I am the way. You know what the world hates? They hate the fact that there's only one way to God. Do you know that? Who's, and, and, and I think it's John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Life. No man cometh to the Father but by who? Yes. By me. The only way to God the Father is by the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and since he came on the scene, whether it's pro prophecy with Israel or today, the church, the body of Christ, uh, the day in the dispensation of grace, if you want to be saved, Paul says, there's one mediator, mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 first, first Timothy chapter number 2. Now, let's keep looking. So he's able to save them, verse 25, to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make what? Intercession for them. That's what a priest did. He made intercession between the people and God. Look at verse 26. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, that's set apart unto God, 
harmless. He was wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove, as he tells his, his uh, followers. Undefiled means he never committed sin, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That issue of made higher than the heavens, it's not like Jehovah's Witness believed that he was a created God. He's the eternal son of God. But what God did by making him the high priest, he put him higher than everything in heaven. He, we saw that in chapter 1. Everything is under the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no one higher except the Father in heaven. Verse 27. Speaking of this high priest, the Lord Jesus, who needeth not daily as those high priests, he's talking about the Levitical priesthood under the law of Moses, to offer up sacrifice. You see that? Did you know that they offered daily sacrifices? You know, when we think of the temple, we think of the feast days in, in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus is the first giving of the law, sets forth the seven feast days, Israel. Passover, Pentecost, excuse me, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, um, trumpets, day of atonement, tabernacles, right? Look what it pointed to, Passover, his death, unleavened bread, put in, sent away, his, his um, burial, first fruits, his resurrection, first fruits from the dead. 50 days later, 50 means Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts 2. That was the fulfillment of it, right? What happens? There's a break. There's a gap of still seven months from the feast days. In Leviticus 26, what happens? The trumpet sound, the, the, day of the, 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 the feast of trumpets is when God tells Moses, sound the trumpets and Israel gathers, right? What's going to happen when the trumpet sound the Lord returns? Israel is going to gather. What's going to happen when he gathers that judgment, that day of atonement where the, his blood, the official ceremony where the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is dedicated for the new covenant for the nation of Israel. That's going to happen in the kingdom. And then tabernacles is God with us, right? Coronation of his kingdom. All of those seven feast days are pictured in their Messiah. Isn't that wonderful? Well, look what happened. Even in those other days that weren't feast days, the priests would take sacrifices. Why? Because the people of Israel who sinned against God, you, you know, they would, have, they would have a conscience that had sin, and they would take this offering, whether it was the, a lamb or, or some other type of bird or something, depending on how poor they were or rich, and if their hearts condemned them for God, they could go down to that temp temple, and they could go to the priest and say, offer this for my sin before Almighty God. They did that every day. And what that showed Israel, all those blood sacrifices show what sin is. It's bloody. It's smelly. Think about all that blood. Uh, if you ever worked at a butcher shop, just blood everywhere. So it's messy. Sin. Smelly. That's why they had incense. <laughs> God had this perfume incense that the priest, it was a type of the prayers, but that was one of the, the things of the incense was to cover the smell of the bloody sacrifices. God had everything, right? We'll talk more about that, but that's what was going on. Notice, because of Jesus Christ, Israel doesn't have to think about those things. He's the sacrifice, the offering. Verse 27, speaking of those priests who needeth not daily as those high priests offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins. Interesting. You know, the Roman Catholic Church, they have you come and... And, and bow in a box. You're bowing, by the way. People don't think. They think they're kneeling, but that's bowing. And there's a person there who's supposed to be your goal between your intercession and you pour out your, your heart, your sins, to this man in this box, a man. Imagine. The book of James says, confess your faults one to another. He's supposed to get down and now tell you his sins, you know. But they don't do that. So you bow down and you, and you go over your sins. Well, notice here it says that he offers for himself. That priest was to offer for his own sins. So in religion today, you're standing, you're kneeling before, bowing before a man who before Almighty God is sinful himself. But that's not what you have to do in Israel. There's a man who's without sin. We just saw he was holy and harmless, undefiled, separate. He's a man you can bow down to. People bow down to the Lord and worship him, the Bible says, and he received the worship. Well, any Jew in that day who bow down in their heart and say, Jesus, you're Lord, 
You died for my sins. You paid. Well, they're going to get it. Look at that. He doesn't have to offer for his own sins, for he had none. God, Paul said about, about the Lord, for God had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He was, he was tempted, John says to Israel, at all points, yet without sin. That's our Lord. He was impeccable. Notice he doesn't have to give for his own sins. Verse 27. Those other priests, they had to give for their own sins and then for the people's sins. For this he, that's Lord, did how many times? Once. Once. When he offered up himself. Roman Catholicism has this thing called transubstantiation. Where literally they believe that that wafer and that cup of wine or ju juice, when you drink it or take it, it becomes the body and blood of the Lord. And what that's doing there, they're offering the Lord over and over and over and over again. But notice that it says that he offered himself how many times? Once for all. You don't need to duplicate and replicate it over and over. There's a once for all payment on the cross, see? They're just adding to the cross work, and then that makes it of non effect. Look at verse 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. What that means? That means they die. <laughs> they're sinners. They're, they're weak in their flesh, but not the Lord, but the word of the oath. And that was the oath to make him priest after the order of Melchizedek. We saw that. When you see in the Bible, you go back to Genesis where it says Abram the Hebrew, he gave tithes to a man named Melchizedek. Melchizedek is not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture, but one place in Psalms, Psalm 110. Where he says, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's talking about the Messiah. Then when you come to the book of Hebrews, Melchizedek, we've been seeing, he, he's mentioned again. What's up with Melchizedek? Well, he has a no beginning, no end. He's like the son of God. And so even from the beginning of Israel's history, God was showing that there was a man even greater than their father Abraham. And it was a type and shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, look, look at verse number, the last verse of chapter 7. That's the word of the oath. That's the oath God gave to his son, which was since the law. Isn't that interesting? The law was given back here through Moses, but that oath to the Messiah by Almighty God was given. Hold your hand there. Let's look at it. Maybe some haven't uh, seen that. Go to Psalm 110. Go back to the book of Psalms. When it says since the law, God gave the law, but then he added something called the oath to his son of the Melchizedekian priesthood. Go with me to Psalm chapter 110. Now some of you all are familiar with this, but let's just focus on the part about that oath. Give me one second. Psalm 110, please. <clears throat> Verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand, what's that next word? Until I make thy enemies thy footstool. According to prophecy, this verse, would Jesus Christ sit forever or would he, there be a time where he would stand? There'd be a time when he would stand, right? We learn from the Psalms, the Father out here, after the rapture, after the, the judgment seat of Christ, when God receives the body of Christ, the church for the heavens, he's going to look at his son and say, now, son, gird thy sword upon thy thigh and ride prosperously. When you see him in Revelation 19, verse 11, he's coming to judge and make war. He's that rider on that horse. Who, who has that crown that says faithful and true, that happens after he's done with us. He's coming back. He's going to make his enemies his footstool. Watch this. By the way, Acts chapter 7, Stephen sees that. You study Acts 7 tonight or that's your homework for the next time. Stephen in Acts 7 at the end, he sees the heavens open and the Son of Man not sitting but standing at the right hand of, 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 of the Father. He says it twice. And according to prophecy, what Stephen is seeing is that the time to commence the day of the Lord, the day of the wrath, the time of Jacob's trouble. But what we learn is God postponed that the last 2,000 years with the age of grace or the dispensation of grace. But what happens? What happens after this dispensation of grace, the judgment to the Christ, he hands it over to the Father, he's going to come back and do something. Look here. Verse 2, Psalm 110, 2. The Lord shall send, that's the Father. By the way, in verse 1, the Lord said unto my Lord, that's God the Father, saying to God the Son, 
Verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of where? Zion. God the Father sends the rod of his strength, his son, out of Zion. I'm going to do a study on New Jerusalem. If somebody asks me about it. I get Bible questions every day we answer. I record on sending audio, then webcam it, put it on YouTube. So I, this Friday, because I'm off for my second job, I'm just going to do that. Put a bunch of them on there for the last couple of weeks. This young man says, you know what? I've never known about New Jerusalem. No one has ever done a study on New Jerusalem. And I thought, I said, he's right. So I am going to do either Friday morning or probably Saturday morning a study on New Jerusalem because it is prominent in Scripture. When you look at the book of Revelation, John sees, he says, the bride, the lamb's wife, he shows me a city, the New Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So I'm going to do a study on New Jerusalem because Paul, what made me think about it, the young man says, but Paul mentions the New Jerusalem in Galatians 4, and he's right. In Galatians 4, Paul talks about the Jerusalem which is above is free. So Isaiah 59 says uh, uh, the Lord comes out of Zion. Romans 11, Paul says the Lord comes to Zion. So the Jerusalem down here is just a type and shadow of the new Jerusalem in the heavens. Zion, by the way, anybody know what Zion means? It means the highest place or the pinnacle. There's not a higher place than where God lives. Zion means the highest place. So his strength is coming out of Zion. Look at verse number two. What is he going to do? Rule thou in the midst of thine what? Enemies. If you look here, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, I think sometimes we forget that during that first thousand years, that, that millennial uh, kingdom, the Gentiles, although they will be in submission under the law, they will still have a sin nature. They'll still be the enemies of Israel. The ones that survive the tribulation period and their leaders. Uh, people say, well, how, how will the Gentiles get into the kingdom? Matthew 25, when it says he's got, you ever, you ever heard of the goat, the sheep and goat judgments? Anybody heard that? Well, let me, let me show you something. Hold your hand here. Go to Matthew 25. People ask about this as well. I, I think about things as we're going through the scripture. Matthew 25. Here's a passage, a prophecy about the Lord's return to this earth. And when, when you hear people talk about the sheep and goat judgment, this is, this is it right here. Let's see if we can get some light from this. Uh, Matthew 25, look at verse 31. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man, now that's the title of the Messiah of Israel. That's from Daniel chapter uh, uh, is it 2 or 7, they call it the Son of Man. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Where's that? Right here. The return to the earth. Guess who's coming with him? And all the holy angels with him. Did you know that the angels are going to have a ministry? Jacob's ladder out here in Genesis, where Jacob wrestles with God, or he has that, that, that dream, and he sees a ladder and the angels ascending and descending. You even hear Christ says, when this, you're going to see, soon enough, you're going to see the Son of Man and the angels ascending and descending. There's going to be this portal, this portal, this gateway to heaven right in Jerusalem, right in this throne, right in the new Jerusalem. And the angels are going to carry on the business affairs of both heaven and earth. That's what they do. They're messengers, ministers. And that's what Jacob saw. He says, this is the, the house of God, man. This is it. And, and the Lord says, well, the angels are going to come with them. They're going to be ministering back and forth. The body of Christ will serve the Lord up here. But the angels will, will judge angels, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6. And so there will be this dual, there will be this cooperation of the heaven and earth. First verse of your Bible, in the beginning God created the what? Heaven and the earth. And when Christ sits down here in his flesh, his glorified flesh, how is he going to rule the heavens? That's through the church, the body of Christ, the body of Christ. He'll physically be down here, but we'll represent him in the heavens and the angels will do the business. It's interesting. Well, he's going to come. Watch what happens. Verse 31, all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his what? Glory. Right there. Kingdom. And before him shall be gathered how many nations? All nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his what from what? Sheep from the goats. That's verse 32. So if somebody says you ever heard of the sheep and goat judgment, here it is. And verse 33, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand 
and the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And the way that kingdom gets in there, the nation, is based upon whether they bless Israel. What was the original Abrahamic covenant? He says, I will bless thee, make thy name great, you'll be a blessing, and through you and your seed shall how many of the families on earth be blessed? All the nations, all the families. That's the, so as they, in, in prophecy, fulfill the Abrahamic covenant, by the way, that's not how God is dealing with the world today. When you rightly divide the word of truth in this dispensation of grace, this parenthetical mystery dispensation, you don't have to bless Israel to be blessed by God. You know how you want to be blessed by Almighty God? In Christ, right? You have to trust Christ. What does Paul say in Ephesians 1, 3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with how many spiritual blessings? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Today, you don't bless... Israel hates Jesus Christ today. They reject him as their Messiah. But in that prophetic program, the way that those nations get blessed by Almighty God, they got to bless Abraham and his people. That's how they're going to get into the kingdom. So somebody says, well, Brother Ron, how is he going to gather all the nations? Is every human being on planet Earth going to stand before the Lord? No. He's going to deal with them through their, their leaders. Their, their kings, their princes, their ambassadors. And it's, it's kind of not how we do things over in America because of our type of uh, republic. But if you go over the Middle East, those nations are called kingdoms, the kingdom of Egypt, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and so forth. They deal with, I guess we have a secretary of state who goes over there, Hillary Clinton. But they do it through their leadership and their foreign policy and those types of things. Evidently, out here in the, in the future, when, when the Muslim nations are all confederate against the people of Israel, the, the other nations of the world who don't be in cahoots with those Muslim nations to destroy Israel off the map, they're going to be blessed by the Lord Jesus Christ. But their leadership, when, when you read the Old Testament, how God dealt with nations was through their kings. He's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords. He dealt with nations through their leaders. So evidently, how he's going to gather all nations, he's going to gather their leadership, their ambassadors, their kings, their princes, their leaders. And based upon their foreign policy of the nation of Israel, will they get in the kingdom? If they bless Israel, they get in the kingdom. If they don't, their, their leadership, that's the point, their leadership. Interesting enough, when Paul is saved, as we hold your hand there, let's kind of look, go, go to Acts chapter 9. You ever wonder why the Lord said this in Acts 9? I did years ago, but then it, it hit me how he deals with nations. Look at Acts chapter 9 real quick. One of the brothers said, we want some meat of the word. Yeah, we, we study the scriptures, baby. We're going, <laughs> we get in the word. This, ain't, this is not for the meek. Meek at heart, but not in the word. We, we, we love the word here. Hey, look at Acts chapter 9. Look what the Lord says when he saved Saul and made him his apostle. Verse 15. So, so the Lord saves Saul of Tarsus. He tells Paul to go to a street called Straight and go to a man's house named Judas. Uh, that's, uh, um, excuse me, Ananias. Ananias. And says, hey, Ananias. He, and so now Ananias is a Jewish believer in Damascus. Christ sends Ananias to tell Paul what happened. Paul is blind. Three days, three nights. He doesn't eat. He doesn't sleep. Type of the nation of Israel. Blinded for those three, uh, uh, three days. Those two, two days, and then they get light on the third day, 2,000 years, and they're going to get light out there. Well, what, watch what happens. Watch what God says, Christ says to Ananias. Verse 15. Ananias is afraid to go. Verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, Ananias. That's who's talking to. For he, that Saul, Paul, is a what type of vessel? Chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and who? Kings. And the children of Israel. Isn't that interesting how the Lord tells them that Paul is going to be my messenger to kings? What is that? Well, evidently, Paul, and we see this in the book of Acts, he went before Agrippa, King Agrippa, and all these leaders. Paul has a ministry to kings to let them know, hey, there's someone you're responsible to. It's Jesus Christ. 
Back here in the book of Joel, he told him to speak to the kings and say, prepare ye war, you Gentile kings. That's the wrath. Today, you know what he's got to say to the kings? Um, God is offering grace and peace. Listen. He's talking to the leadership of the Gentile world saying grace and peace. But there's a day coming where he's going to have to reckon. But today, grace and peace. Get in right now. He talked to kings. So go back to uh, Matthew 25. So when the Lord returns, he's going to gather the nations, but he's going to do it through their leadership. And he's going to look at their policy and say, let's see. The angel's going to open the books and say, oh, yeah. Lord, they, uh, they blessed them. They blessed their people. The Lord says, then they get into the kingdom. Well, Lord, these people, they cursed your people. They didn't help your people. The sheep get in, the ones who blessed Israel, the goats, they don't. And God holds their leaders responsible. Well, that's, the, that's what God is talking about there. Go back to, uh, go back to um, Psalm chapter 110. That's what's going on. Here in Psalm 110. So when you're reading that, that's the future when Jesus Christ returns. All right, we're in Psalm 110. Here we go. So he's going to send out verse number two, the rod of his strength out of Zion. Zion means the highest place of the pinnacle. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. They're still going to have their flesh. There's, the only reason they're going to obey him is because he's ruling it with a rod of iron. Now that I'm a father of a three-year-old, I understand that principle. I look in my daughter's eyes, and she, and, and she, she looks at me like, yeah, if I was bigger and I was stronger, we'd fight. <laughs> the only reason I'm listening to you is because you bigger and you could spank me then. But wait till I can see it in her eyes. She just wants Once I tell her something and she don't like it, she's going, hit the couch. She just <laughs> I say, yeah, hit that couch. Don't hit me. Well, in, in an essence, she's submitting to my authority, even though her little sin nature wants to rebel, because she knows I can harm her, I can hurt her, I can punish her, punish her. Well, in essence, that's what these Gentiles are doing. Do you think when Jesus Christ comes that those Muslim nations, or those people who survived the, the, the tribulation, they're still going to say, I don't really believe that he is God. Yeah, he's stronger than us. Islam today, they just submit to certain uh, rule, uh, other nations just because they, they don't have the firepower. <laughs> but in their hearts, they say, yeah, we're going to get you. And wait till that Antichrist comes. And he's going to give them some firepower to first destroy Israel, the little Satan. And then they're going to probably most likely go after America, the great Satan, in their minds. But really, we're too powerful. Both countries are too powerful right now. But in their hearts, they're saying, okay, we're going to have peace with you, but wait till we get some power. And the Antichrist, who's going to be under the power of Satan, going to give them power. And once they get enough power, they're going to try to attack Israel, and most likely America too. But we'll be gone, by the way. Don't y'all worry about it. The body of Christ will already be in heaven, okay? This is all future after we're in heaven. Verse 3. Thy people, that's Israel. Psalm 110, verse 3. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And there's the Messiah. His people Israel will be willing to serve him. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. You know what that's saying? This, this same Jesus who those angels tell those guys, you men of Galilee, why stand you looking, why, why look you steadfastly in the heaven? This same Jesus whom you see if going up to heaven will come back in like manner as you see him going. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to be in his 33-year-old body, glorified body, look just as young 2,000 years later as he did when he went up. He's going to be in a do of that. By the way, all of, all of them are. In your resurrected body, if you're over the age of 33 today, which I am, and many of you are, uh, what if you're a 90-year-old saint? When you die or the rapture takes place, you're not going to be in your resurrected body, you know, going around like that. You're going to be in the do of your, that youth. God created Adam as a, as a man, 33 years old. The Lord Jesus died. His body is 30. You're going to be in the prime. You're going to look. You, you got at 90 or you raptured at 90, but your body will look like it's in its 30s. You'll be in the do of thy youth. That'll be the Lord. Watch this. Verse 4. Here's that oath that G, G, uh, Jesus received from the Father after the law. The Lord hath sworn, there's the oath, and will not what? Repent. 
Can I just say this about repentance? I, I'm dealing with a sister in the Lord. Maybe she'll come on Sunday. And her, her main stumbling block is the issue of repentance. Because she has learned from the religious system that you must repent before or to get saved. And when they say repent, it's not the biblical definition of repentance, which is to change or to turn direction, change direction. They mean to be sorry for your sins or stop your sins. And I say, no. Paul says, and while you're yet sinners, Christ died for you. While you're yet ungodly, without strength, in your sin, he's the Savior. How can a dead person who's dead in sins change their ways and then come to Christ? No, you come to Christ by trusting Christ. He'll change you. Then you repent after. So you'll hear me do the gospel on the radio. You don't have to move a muscle prayer, prayer, go to church, give a tithe, repent, be water baptized. Don't do anything to be saved. All these things come after salvation, but to be saved, you trust Jesus Christ. You rely exclusively upon his shed blood. Well, that's been a stumbling block in her mind because people have been lying to her, telling her people have to do things to be saved. God's grace says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Repentance comes as believers get, get set. And when, when that person gets saved, they learn the truth, they err in their lifestyle. Paul calls them repent, change their direction. But he tells believers to repent. He never tell, Paul never told a lost person to repent in his epistles. He never told a lost person. Because Paul and God knows you're dead in your sins. You're dead. You can't do anything to please God. Stop trying, trust Christ, and then God will give you the life to repent. Well, notice here, who does the repenting here? God. Most of the reference to the word repent in your Bible, when I say this, people just like, really? I say, yeah, check it out. Most of the reference to repent, repentance, repent, is to the Lord himself. He doesn't sin. So if, if repentance means to be sorry for your sins or, or turning from sins, and most of the references in your Bible is to the Lord himself, what is people saying about the Lord? See, the Lord doesn't sin. Repenting means to change direction. First time you see repent is in Genesis 6, 6, when he's about to flood the earth. It repenteth the Lord that he made man. Moses tells the Lord as he's about to destroy Israel once more, Moses says, repent of this thy evil, Lord. And he's not calling God a, a sinner. He's saying, you want to destroy him, but I know you're just testing me. God says, I'm just testing Moses. So I want you to see the word repent in the Bible is not being sorry for sins or turning from sins. Look how it's used about the Lord. Verse 4, the Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou, that's the Messiah, thou art a priest, how long? Forever. forever. How long is forever? Eternity. Eternity, forever. After the order, not of Aaron, of who? Yeah. Melchizedek. Now, that's the oath that, uh, that they're talking about. We've got 10 minutes left. Go back to Hebrews chapter number 7. So when the Bible says in Hebrews that there was an oath given to the Messiah after the law, the law was given, the sons of Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, they were the, the priest. But God swore to his son that he would have a priesthood not after the order of Aaron or Levi, but after the order of Melchizedek, the man back here who was greater than their father Abraham, type of the Messiah. All right, let's look at it. Uh, let's finish up verse number, uh, the last verse of verse chapter 7 again. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, that means they die. But the word of the oath, we just read that in Psalm 110, which was since the law, or after the law, maketh the Son, capital S-O-N, who is that? That's Christ Jesus, who is consecrated, how long? Forevermore. Verse chapter 8. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Let's sum it up. Here's the, the summation. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty, where? In the heavens. By the way, when the writer of Hebrews wrote this, the temple in Jerusalem was still standing. The temple in Jerusalem wasn't destroyed, well, I gotta keep this open, till AD 70 during the dispensation of grace. Paul gets saved AD 31. From AD 30 to AD 70, 40 years, God gives Israel 40 is that number of, of trial and testing. From the, from the time that they crucified their Messiah, AD 30, till, till the time where the Roman through Titus, the general Titus, destroyed that temple was 40 years. 
That's a picture type of God saying, okay, you all destroyed my temple. I'm going to have, I'm going to destroy your temple. Beautiful picture. Paul is saved, AD 31. The dispensation of grace is gone. And Paul's, the mystery of Christ is being revealed through signs and wonders and gifts of the spirit. Paul is writing his epistles. We're, we're the, the prophets of the body of Christ collecting the Bible. A council didn't put it together. God's prophets put it together. Paul is writing Romans through Philemon. By AD 70, every one of Paul's epistles were written. The Bible is complete. Paul died about AD 68. 2 Timothy was that last book that Paul wrote before his death. But here, the book of Hebrews was written during that Acts transition period. The temple is still up. He's pointing them to a time, this future time, where, all right, now watch what happens. You've got to get this. People say, well, is Hebrews calling them not to give sacrifice? Or what? Well, here's what Hebrews is doing. The Lord Jesus Christ never had his Jewish followers stop keeping the law. you got to remember that. When we study the book of Acts on Wednesday, when we get to the, uh, the later chapters, James, the other Jewish apostles, and thousands of religious Jews who are saved, or saved in the little flock, are still keeping the law. To the point where they tell Paul to offer a sacrifice, God stops Paul. That's not his ministry. But what a Jew is supposed to do, a guy asked me this in an email like earlier today, what is a Jew supposed to do? Trust Christ and keep the law. They do both. When will they stop offering the sacrifices at the temple? When the abomination that maketh desolate, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, takes place, right? Who warned them of that? Did the Lord, Matthew 24, say, When ye shall see the abomination that maketh de make desolate, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Daniel chapter 9, stand in the holy place, then flee, right? So when will the Jews, the believing Jews, know to stop offering in the temple when they see the abomination make a desolate. The Lord warned. Well, if the dispensation of grace began, which it did, that means this stuff was postponed. The Antichrist coming was postponed. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, what's keeping the Antichrist from coming is the body of Christ. Well, what happens? Well, time goes on, AD 70, the way that we know that now Paul is the issue, God makes it so clear to all the Jews that he just has the Romans destroy the temple. Now the Jews don't have a place to go to offer their blood sacrifice. But they got an answer. Who? Paul. His message of grace. That the blood of Jesus Christ is the answer. So you can just see the working of God in the book of Acts. When we study Acts on Wednesdays, I'll show you. Okay, we'll look at that. But what I'm saying is, this book of Hebrews comes right in this time period of the diminishing of Israel. And the temple is still up. And they won't stop offering blood sacrifices until either first the temple is destroyed. But they, they didn't know that, obviously they don't know the temple is going to be destroyed. Only God knew it, AD 70. But they're waiting for the Antichrist to the believing to, to set up the abomination of the desolate. So when someone asks you, what is Hebrews? Is, is God stopping them from offering the sacrifice? Well, no and yes. No until the abomination. Then they'll say, well, Lord, if we can't offer in the, in the temple, how do we get our sins forgiven, as it were? How do we? Well, because there's a heavenly temple. That's what he's saying. Look here. Look, look at the end of verse 1. So I look at verse 1. Now the, of, of the things which we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such an high priest. Who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the what? Yeah. Heavens. Don't worry about the earthly one. Watch verse 2. A minister of the sanctuary. Uh, if you want to know what that word sanctuary means. It means a, a, a safe haven or a set apart place. A safe haven. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. Which the Lord pitched and not man. Uh oh. Well we only got four minutes. But next, next time. Two weeks from now. We'll do Acts next Wednesday. Two weeks from now. We hit... Chapter 8, we're going to go back to the Old Testament when God gave Moses the instructions for the tabernacle. It's very interesting. We're going to go back to Exodus and we're going to see what was taking place. And what we're going to see is that the tabernacle that Moses built, by the way, the tabernacles was that temporary dwelling place of the Lord while they were in the wilderness. 
when, when David's son Solomon came to power, he built a temple in Jerusalem. But until there, they had the tabernacle, um, the Ark of the Covenant. You see David going back and forth. The Gentiles, Philistines would take it. Then the, David comes and rescues it and all that. Well, that's before the temple. Once the temple is, is, is of, of Solomon's temple is built, permanent dwelling place, type of the second coming of Christ. Um, but then it's destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Rebuilt or reestablished, as it were, through Ezra and Nehemiah. Just to kind of little, little the deal of it. Herod then, who, who's, who's in power in the Lord's there. Herod, it's called Herod's Temple in the Lord's day. He added to it and made it this big, beautiful structure. And then the, the Romans destroyed it. Well, in the future, one of the things the Antichrist will do, a false Christ, he will make a peace treaty, peace deal with Israel, right? The main thing he's going to do is going to allow them to rebuild their temple right over there on the Temple Mount. But you know what's over there now, right? A Muslim shrine. So it's, he's got to be wily enough, and he will, to get the Muslims and the Jews to agree. It's going to take the power of Satan to do that, okay? It's going to take, because, I mean, you think the Muslims are going to let them? Uh-uh. The third holy site, is the, the third holy site for Islam is the Temple Mount, which is the... I mean, that's the holy site for the Jews. But somehow he's going to get them to agree through trickeries, Daniel said, to build that temple. And here's how he's going to do it. He's going to say, let's build the temple. He's going to tell the Islam, let's build that temple. Because he's, he's going to be one himself. He's going to be Islam. Trust me, we'll build that temple. What better way to get all the Jews in one place at once so that we can destroy them? That's what they're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> This is in the Bible. You can just see it. They just gather them all. And you know who's going to turn the tables? The Lord. You ever heard of Armageddon, right? The Battle of Armageddon is God's going to say, all right, do you, we can play that. The Valley of Jezreel, the Valley of the City, he's going to get all, it's that valley right over there. He can get all the people at once, all the enemies, and boom, destroy them. I personally think it's going to be nuclear warfare because the type of stuff that you see. Uh, the prophets in Israel were using terminology of their day, but like flames of fire, people, their, their skin and their eyes are just being burned off in an instant, and then fall out from the radiation and things like that, the, the, how it affects the, the, the waters and the trees. Like, you can kind of see that it could be not only a nuclear blast, but the fallout from the radiation. When we get to Revelation, I'll show all that stuff that I see there. But who knows? It could just be all supernatural. But it looks like that's what it's going to be. Uh, nuclear warfare. We got to end, but let's let's end in this verse here. Verse number two. Christ is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So what we're going to do, we're going to pick up next time. We're going to see the one that man pitched, Moses and his guys. And, and we're going to see that that was a type and shadow. Here, I'll leave you with this. Here's what we're going to see in two weeks. God didn't just tell Moses and have Moses write down what to do. God drew it. Not, not drew it. God showed Moses the tabernacle. He showed him. The best way I can explain it is 3,500 years ago, God gave Moses a hologram, as it were. Not probably not even a hologram. We had to do a hologram. He, he gave him a vision. He gave him a scaled down ver version of the true tabernacle. That's what he did. We're going to see that. See, weird, but that's what he did. Because he's going to keep saying, you know what I showed you at the mount? You, see, you know what I showed you, what you saw? That's how I want it. So God, in essence, showed Moses a scale model of that tabernacle. He did that 3,500 years ago. He showed him what it looked like, the heavenly tabernacle. And Moses recorded that. And God put in Moses, by the way, and his spirit put in the men who made it how to do it perfectly. Even when they built the temple through Solomon, God's spirit put in the men how to make the temple. And I'll just say this. God is building a temple today, right? What, what temple God is, building, is God building today? The body of God. The church, the body of Christ. Therefore, he puts his spirit in men and give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding to build up the body of Christ. That's what ministers are supposed to do today. 
That's why they call ministers the ones who build the temple. God has put his spirit in men, and if they listen to Paul, we'll see that next time. Who is the wise master builder, 1 Corinthians 3. You want the blueprints on how to build a body? Well, God will put his spirit in you when you trust Christ as a minister. He'll give you a blueprint through the Paul and Grace message. And as you study out how Paul says to build a body, you'll build in yourself, but you'll build up the body of Christ. All right, we got to end. If no one ever loved you enough to ask you if you were to die today, do you know for sure you're going to spend eternity? I love you, but more importantly, God loves you. And Paul, our apostle, says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God commended his love toward us. He demonstrated and proved his love in a tangible way in human history. And that while we were yet sinners, not repenting, yet sinners, Christ died for us. You don't have to move a muscle, prayer, prayer, go to church, give a tithe, repent, be water baptized. There's no outward manifestation of anything you can do in your flesh, but trust the Lord. Believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and, and you'll be saved. When you are saved, God gives you eternal life. How long is eternal? Forever. Forever. And the gifts and calling to God without repentance. If he gives you the gift of eternal life to Jesus Christ our Lord, it's forever. He'll forgive you your sins, past, present, and future. We all still sin against God. We ought not, but we do. That's why it's by grace, not of our works. But after you get saved, that's where good works come in. God wants you to be a part of a grace assembly where the word of God is rightly divided, where you're getting the meat of the word, nourished in the word, and you're, you're ministering your time, you're treasuring your talents to getting the word of God in yourself and others. We'll help you right here in Northern California Grace Fellowship. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you for the word of God tonight, Father. We thank you we can get into your word. We know that most of this world uh, doesn't care about your word. They, they could not care less about the Bible, about God, about the Lord Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about anything spiritual. They're trying to be religious and spiritual without, without you, without the Bible. But Father, you have some saints who have taken out their time this, this Wednesday night by simple faith to come and fellowship in your word together. We think about our brothers and sisters in Christ who are listening to this by way of technology. Our brothers and sisters who aren't with us tonight but will be with us in the future on Sunday and in the days to come. We do pray for all those who listen to the radio broadcast here in our local area. Uh, that there's some hearts out there that desire the truth like these dear brothers here who desire to know more. Let them know that we have a place for them to come and hear the word and fellowship with those who like precious faith. Thank you for that and for those saints out there who have been a part of that with their prayers, their time, their talents, and their treasures to get this out there. We thank you as we take our break for Q&A. We give you thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.